Do I feel lucky? Dogma 95, you know, these crazy films made by Danes running around with camcorders, full of damaged people, fist fights, hard sex, and general mayhem. So, where the hell did it come from? In 1995, the centenary year of cinema, director Lars von Trier decided it was time to start a revolution. Von Trier had already earned a reputation as the great enfant terrible of European cinema, hugely acclaimed for complex art films like Europa. Made in 1991, it established Von Trier as an incorrigible stylist and innovator. International success came with Breaking the Waves, winner of the Grand Prix at the 1996 Cannes Film Festival. Together with another Danish director, Thomas Vinterberg, he wrote a manifesto called Dogma 95. I remember calling Thomas and asking him if he wanted to, to start a new wave with me. You know, that was the words I remember. The manifesto railed against how shallow and crass movies had become. It proposed ten restrictive rules for making simpler, more truthful films using minimal equipment. And with a mischievous nod to Catholic piety, these rules were branded the vow of chastity. Von Trier and Winterberg enlisted two more directors, Søren Krau Jakobsen and Christian Levering, thus forming the Dogma Brotherhood. And following the example of Jean-Luc Godard in the French New Wave of the 1960s, Von Trier chose to launch his offensive in Paris, birthplace of so many great revolutions. In the theater in Paris kind of took these red leaflets and kind of threw them out over the, the, the balconies. It was beautiful, it was kind of like in the old days. And then I read, you know, I read the manifesto, and then they asked me questions, and I said I was allowed by the brothers to read the manifesto, but not to discuss it. <laughs> I thought that was very clever. Was kind of <laughs> and they all said, why do, you, why do you come here when you hate film so much? That was kind of the response to this. Did you both answer that? No, but, but I thought it was interesting. It was really provocating. Yeah. Well, that's very strange, because why? You know, I'm, I'm not saying that people have to, you know, to talk with people. I'm just saying that I am doing this. So, just what were those controversial commandments? Chicago, 1935. Pause a moment for reflection. Dogma dictates that the director must not be credited. So let us begin again. Better, but Dogma also states that you cannot use any special effects or filters, so no superimposed titles. Chicago, 1935. And none of those smart aleck special effects, like painting that blood red, when everything else is in black and white. We're still blaspheming. Dogma forbids genre films, so no westerns, no science fiction, or in this case, no gangster films. Also, the films must take place here and now, so no pretending otherwise. London, 2000. Furthermore, you must not have any sounds that are recorded separately from the image. So banish your big orchestral soundtrack, your overdubbed gunshots, and your voiceover. The sounds must be real. And widescreen, that big cinematic experience, is also proscribed. Instead, dogma filmmakers must use the squarer academy ratio, like the early silent films and everyday television. On top of that, shooting must be done on 35mm film stock a rule which we'll discover hasn't been that easy for the brethren to obey. Further stripping away the artifice, all those smooth tracking shots and steadying tripods, well, you can't have them either. Everything must be handheld. This further simplifies production, making it possible to film with fewer crew members 
and less equipment. Oh, yes. Dogma demands there be no superficial action. So purge the story of weapons and murders. And all those pretentious arty filmmakers can kiss their black and white goodbye. Dogma films are exclusively in color and vital to the whole ethos of Back to Basics production. Special lighting is unacceptable. Natural lighting or lights found on location are all you've got to work with. And finally, absolutely no sets or props are permitted. So all filming is on location and you use what you find there. Taken all together, these 10 rules can save directors from the vices and the tricks of the trade that they so often succumb to. They must redeem themselves by forcing the truth out of characters and settings at the cost of any good taste or aesthetic consideration. Thus, I make my vow of chastity. The resulting films have a very distinct flavor. The emotional life is very explosive in all of them, which I think is because you have nothing else to tell the story than the actors. You have nothing else to, to use when, when you want to express feelings. You don't have the music to make the crescendo. You have to make them faint or puke or fight or something to express whatever you want to get out. <laughs> We're going to Denmark to find out what the hell these Danes think they're doing. And when I say we, I mean myself and my crack team of multi-skilled digital video operators who'll be dogging my every move. With our favorite track by Kim Larsen, Denmark's top folk rock superstar, we toured Copenhagen. You know, I really thought it'd be bigger. Is Dogma 95 just a way of having fun with film? Or is it a whole new way of looking at life through a lens? Is it just a passing fad in art house cinema, or can it capture a wider audience and inspire other filmmakers in its wake? Or, in the end, is it just a clever way to make films cheaply? These were the questions that were preying on my mind. We're at the gates of Film City, a group of buildings on the heavily wooded outskirts of Copenhagen. Strange to relate, this place is in fact the beating heart of the Dogma 95 operation, because it houses the offices of Entropa and of Nimbus, the two production companies responsible for the Danish Dogma product. In the movie business, the Dogma Manifesto hadn't been taken too seriously at first. After all, Von Trier had written manifestos before. In one of these, he'd even described himself as a simple masturbator of cinema. So, wasn't Dogma just another self-publicizing jerk-off? The mood changed dramatically at the 1998 Cannes Film Festival, when Martin Scorsese's jury gave a top prize to Dogma No. 1, Festen. And Festen, Thomas Winterberg. I thought he would be talented, but not too talented. Then later on, it, it, it turned out that he was too talented, but that you can't win them all, you know? <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Are you proud of him there because of uh, the way in which he took the concept and made a success of it? Not at all, not at all. He should be grateful, the bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Festen is the story of a family celebration that goes horribly wrong. Smitten er mest hjertelige grin, man kunne forestille sig. Og der kiggede vi gerne ind to sekunder, så sad vi begge to og skraldgrinede, og vi selvfølgelig opdagede det. Det er klart. Men, øh, men der skete jo aldrig noget, nej. Øh, det, der viste sig at skulle være meget farligere, det var, når far skulle i bad. Jeg ved ikke, om I kan huske, at far skulle altid i bad. Øh, når han skulle det, så tog han øh, Linda og jeg ind på hans kontor. Først, sjov nok, der var lige noget, han skulle ordne først. Og øh, så låste han døren og øh, trak persianerne ned og tjekkede noget lys, fint skulle det være. Og øh, så tog han skjorten af og sine bukser, og det skulle vi så også gøre. Og så lagde han os på den grønne brix, som nu øh, er smidt ud, og voldtog os. Udnyttede os seksuelt, havde sex med sin kære små. Ha. Her for et par måneder siden, da min søster døde, gik det op for mig, at, øh, at Helge var en meget renlig mand, så tit som han gik i bad. Det er sjovt, at Christian makes his 
first terrible speech. It looks as if some of the actors haven't actually heard what he said. We didn't tell the extras that the film was about child abuse and that he was going to make a speech like that. So they were there for 14 days, getting to know each other, becoming a family, huge fans of the father. Uh, He's been doing 40 films as the good guy. And then uh, and suddenly this guy stands up revealing this. It was interesting because nothing really happened. It's quite a quite true moment, actually. Exactly. People couldn't really deal with it. So they just kept talking. <laughs> I have understood that it has uh, really touched something Danish. Um, and I've understood that people have felt that very provoked by a film coming that close to something they know. Deprived of their usual technical tricks, dogma directors depend more than most upon their actors. Paprika Steen is virtually the mascot of the movement, having appeared in the first three films. Actually, I didn't know what dogma was before I, before I was in it and just, you know, working with it. We heard that we don't have to follow, the, the actors doesn't have to follow the camera, the camera has to follow the actors. So actually we could just, you know, forget about the camera. They would, they would get us. Suddenly the camera became, how do you say, that's a cliche, but the fly, a fly on the wall. Oh, I'm sorry, but you came. Yes, I'm sorry. Can you take me out? He's, I don't know, he's trying to throw me out. <laughs> The story reads like a classical piece of Scandinavian theatre, but the dogma rules, including handheld camera and natural lighting, conspire to make the film feel more like a disturbing home movie. Crucial in the development of this visual style is cameraman Anthony Dodd Mantle, who's now shot three of the first six Dogma films. And he's celebrated here in Lars von Trier's Breaking the Waves. Anthony Dodd Mantle, you are a sinner, and you deserve your place in hell. The, the Dogma cameraman, the dog, Mr. Dogma, Anthony Dogma Mantle. When those rules were written on the lavatory seat or wherever they were written, uh, I think one was imagining the kind of Second World War, whatever, 35 mil handheld camera, available light, let's go for it, boys, charge, you know. <laughs> da, 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 da. And it was a financial or budgetary choice for you that the first one was, was digital. Definitely, yeah, yeah. definitely. So we went for the video and I thought, well, we've got to do something dynamic here. The only camera that for me really sat in my hand and I really felt, well, this is a weapon, you know was a Sony at that time called the PC-7, which is a, about twice the size of this glass. And uh, I'm sure you know the camera. It was the first generation consumer camera. And I realized I could make movements and make, make this, kind of, this kind of look work on Thomas' film because it was a story that would be appropriate for it. It was like, almost like the camera was, was to be operated by some family member who didn't really quite grasp what was going on around him. At Cannes, this raw look caught critics by surprise. I think there was some perplexity because uh, suddenly on the big screen in the Palais you were watching something that looked like a home video. This was very odd. There was a feeling that something had somehow wandered onto the screen. And I wanted this square academy organic mass to bubble up there. I just wanted to find a cinematic language that I felt related to the pretty catastrophic, pitiful, amusing as well situation these family members were in. I wanted to like sort of get a Vermeer and get a Rembrandt and get a big soup spoon and sort of go like this and really you know, poor jokes. You allowed yourself one violation of the handheld rule, am I right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I used to 
boomstick. I gathered the camera onto this, so it was like part of the handle. I was still holding it, it was just an extension to my hands, and I had it up in the sky and just whacked it down into the face of this actress. I suddenly glanced across the room, and there's this mirror. And I'm standing there in shot, and you can actually see it as the camera's moving down. You just glance across the back of the room, you'll see this pole and this idiot probably as well. But even if that doesn't break the letter of the law, surely giving the film a visual style breaks the spirit of the vow of chastity. We didn't prepare, we just saw the scene and then we, we talked about where to put the camera so that we felt that it kind of happened in the moment. Mm. And um, of course that became aesthetic choices, but it became instant and improvised aesthetic choices, which I found was quite okay. Controversial, acclaimed around the world, and a bigger hit in Denmark than Titanic, Festen launched Dogma with a bang. Even more controversial than Festen was von Trier's own Dogma offering, The Idiots. And at Cannes, its notoriety was exploited by a central figure in the selling of Dogma, Von Trier's business partner in Zentropa, the cigar-smoking, bike-riding, table-bashing, press-baiting ringmaster of the Dogma Circus, Peter Albeck Jensen. As my partner has, you know, an artificial fun in between his first and his family name, which is totally fake, which is also a movie tradition, I've adopted the cigar, which also is a movie tradition. Can you tell us how you and Lars von Trier first hooked up together? Um, it was in 88 and I was uh, went bankrupt with my first company and then I had to be employed, you know, which was pretty disgusting for me. Uh, and uh, last was, you can say, artistically he was uh, bankrupt because, you know, nobody wanted to invest in his movies. It's a lie. Yeah. I've never been, well... <laughs> That's what I was afraid He of. has been all his life. <laughs> Maybe, you know, it was because two flops, you know, united and was in desperate need for, <laughs> for each other, I don't know. But, <laughs> but they had works ever since, yeah. And it's still not good. <laughs> <laughs> but we're working on it. And both uh, Lars and I are also uh, old left wings, you know, which we are pretty proud of. Was it this hand or was it this hand? Did have to... yes. We talk in the phone about nothing three to four times each day. Absolutely about nothing. Never about work. Just like lovers? Yeah, all girlfriends, uh, and uh, we've never seen each other privately, and uh, that, that's very important for us, that, uh, that, that the friendship doesn't uh, include any kind of privacy. Right, so you wouldn't go out for a drink together? And... Nope, nope, that is, sounds pretty disgusting for both of us to, <laughs> <laughs> to be together in our spare time. Jesus Christ, that's horrible, yeah. This is his car. Camouflage painted electric golf car on a military camp, yeah. If you really push it, I think it goes around 20 kilometers per hour. There's a little flash here, it goes when he's driving around. So. In 1996, Von Trier and Ulbeck Jensen had collaborated on Breaking the Waves, a film which foreshadowed certain elements of dogma. It's great, you're great. Great moving back. Um, maybe you could talk to me. Pretty proud of Lars that you know after breaking the ways it would have been so easy for him to make a little bit more slick film and a little bit more Hollywood like you know and everybody would have sitting there applauding in their fatty greasy hands you know and say now he's become adult you know uh, and then you know he makes a film that practically everybody hates. The film is about a group of middle class malcontents who decide to provoke the community at large by behaving like idiots or spazzing as they call it. Their desire to challenge what society calls good behavior can be taken as a metaphor for the intentions of dogma itself. This idea of 
putting limitations on yourself, something that, of course, when you think about it, something you do all the time, but it's provocating to do it in, in public. The idiots embodies the manifesto's commitment to abandon aesthetics and good taste. The von Trier of old would never have allowed himself such sloppy framing and jarring cuts. But, like he says, that's what you get when you follow the rules. What you have done with film until today is that you have made such a great, great effort to make it very smooth, everything. Otherwise, it doesn't look real. But what looks real, you know, I, I think it can be much, much more abstract. And you still, I think that the, within the brain of the spectator or anybody, there is a will to find the storyline, if you want to call it that, or the logic between uh, the things that are happening. I'm sure that this will is what we're working with. And we should dare much more and kind of, because you want to find it anywhere. The acting in The Idiots and in Festen is really different. I think that uh, he takes a lot more chances, Lars, with his actors, and he makes them go further out and make them, makes them go out when, where it's really embarrassing. I mean, also bad embarrassing, bad acting. But it sort of came out, you know, in a good way. From the idea he got until we f finished, it was really, it was dogma all the way. <laughs> it's what you are yearning for when you're an actor, this freedom. There's no limit, there's no barriers, and it just comes out. <laughs> as well as the rules, von Trier has set up a kind of a social theory, and he's working with a social theory, you know, the idea of um, the cast as a kind of collective and, you know, people interacting with each other and with the outside world in a very peculiar way. I don't think that this, that we went far enough, you know. I, I had hoped that it would be much more kind of, like, collective, you know, oh. mm. But, but of course, it, 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 my, my purpose was, yeah. well, I was trying to, to do this differently from what I've done before. Finally, Lars spoke movingly of his secret mentor. Oh, Baden Powell, he was a good man. He would have made a wonderful doctor film, I'm sure. With very little boys running around naked in the woods. Yeah. Yes. Ah! Oh, no. They were out looking for Baden Powell, you know. Ah! <laughs> As Lars drove up into the sunset, we prepared ourselves to meet another icon of Danish cinema. Søren Krag Jakobsen is the third member of the Dogma Brotherhood and one of Denmark's most respected directors. But on our travels, we'd been told rather more about his past life as a rock and roll legend. It's not sure after all this time, the anticipation. <laughs> Here we are. It's from uh, 1975 or something like that. This is a classic in Denmark. Yeah. It's a classic song. So. Is it sort of vocals? Is yes, he sing himself and have written the tune and, and uh, everything. Søren is uh, my generation's biggest idol when we were kids and teenagers. He made teenage movies and teenage records and we were just like, oh, Søren Kari Arsen is the greatest in the world. Did you buy his records? No, I didn't, but everybody else did. I was more a disco queen, you know. It's a very, very strange name, right? Which name? Yours? I wish my name was Rock Honda. <laughs> 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 I start all interviews all over the world where people say, please, just before we go on, you know, sp could you pronounce your name? Søren Krav Jacobsen. I always compare the dogma movement to the unplugged wave in the beginning of the 90s, right? Yeah. Saying, why in hell did uh, 
your eclepton suddenly start to play unplugged. Of course, you, because you were so surrounded by new technique in the studios, uh, you could do everything to your voice now, pitch it up, widen it out, sample it in, do whatever. And suddenly these guys, of course, wanted to hear how good they really were. And that's why uh, they made these acoustic uh, records, which some of them are lovely, I think. And that's exactly what we are doing with film here. Mifuna is an oddball romantic comedy about two brothers trapped in the remote Danish countryside. Unlike Lars and Thomas, Søren wanted to tell an upbeat story with a more conventional look to it. Mifuna! Hvad siger du, Mifuna? Jeg tror, han er her. Mifuna! Hvor er det? Hvor er det? Mifuna! Du er stor og sur og styvende samurai. Hvor er det? Lars and I often talked about, you know, when we had all the dogma rules and the manifesto and, and all these things, I said, beside that, Lars, what is this about? And he said, it's of course to give you and me a joyful filmmaking back. I said, good. It happened to suit my temper very much, this, this speed you're doing in it, this energy there's in a, in a production form like that. I mean, actors come in the morning, they work eight hours a day. We do eight, ten scenes a day. They are warm like running engines, right? Yes. And it gives it an energy which I really believe you can see up on the big screen. Now you became the first of the brothers to uh, to shoot a dogma film with a film camera with film in it. I liked the experiment with the, with finding a type of film that I could push as as much as possible. Mm. We're shooting shooting 1,000 Asa indoor, yes. pushing it two stops, mm. and uh, I think it worked very well with the history because it's alive. Looks a bit like Polish film 1969. I wanted to go back there because I happened to like that. I don't have anything against doing a, a feature film on video with three cameras. I've been doing so much three camera things on television back in the beginning of the 70s. I said, it's too easy. I mean, the challenge must be, must be that you have a, one camera here, you shoot it on film, and that's a uh, sport, right? <laughs> you know, celebration and the idiots also, you know, they're, they're interesting films, both of them in their own rights. And, and, and we knew, and certainly so knew, that Mifuni was going to be something completely different and in, in itself much more gentle, and that's what it scores points on and also loses. You know, some, some people are saying, where's the edge? Dogma is not a style. Dogma is a set of rules. But of course I ran into that many times where people said, don't look like a dogma film. Of course, so, don't look like a dogma film. Because I asked Tony many times to, 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 to stop moving. It would have been totally absurd for me running around with, like, you know, a camera on my head and one out in the breast pocket and, you know, let's shoot it like this. I don't believe that the intensity and energy is in the restless camera. I think it's between actors. Mifuna won the Silver Bear at the 1999 Berlin Film Festival, further promoting the dogma cause and Danish cinema. The reason for hitting the table so hard is, of, of course, when you're a small country, you have to, to yell to, to get hurt. It's the same thing as a person with a small penis wanting a huge motorbike. I think part of the, the, the arrogance behind Dogma 95 is that we represent a very small country with very small penises. Leaving Denmark, we tracked down the fourth Danish Dogma brother on our home turf, London. Christian Levering, a big-time commercials director, was cutting his film here in Soho, once home to the author of another rather influential manifesto. It had become so much a thing to say, well, that's a way to do a film. There's like a standard way. And there's also a standard way of telling a story, because that all this is very controllable. And I think dogma is just a way to say, okay, let's do it differently. 
The King is Alive boasts an international cast, including Janet McTeer and Jennifer Jason Lee. It's about a group of tourists stranded in the African desert. Facing almost certain death, they try to lift their spirits by performing yeah. Shakespeare's King Lear. Nothing. Nothing will come of nothing. Speak again. Good, my liege. Unhappy that I am, I cannot leave, have. It's heave. Heave. Ow. Sorry. Unhappy that I am, I cannot heave my heart into my mouth. I love your majesty according to my bond, no more, no less. Because when you shoot Dogman, the actually set up of the scene is very, very fast. And because of that, we were able to reshoot a lot of the scenes two or three times. And we went on until we failed. Now it's there, now it's good. Well, it's about a king who has two daughters. Right. Or maybe it's three, I'm not really sure, but anyway, he has a couple mm -hmm. of kids. And he's old and he wants to retire and he wants to divide his kingdom between his kids. Right. So whoever says they love him the most gets the biggest chair, that's it. And you get to play the evil daughter, right? Sure. I get to play the real bitch. You don't have to worry, you know. Nobody has to fall in love and everybody gets to die in the end. In a sense, the story of your film, a group of individuals, under adversity, relationships falling apart. You guys a certain relation to movies like The Towering Inferno, or <laughs> Poseidon Adventure, or Alive. If you look at that rule, I think the way that it's meant, it's, which is like, it's not a Western, it's not a film noir, it's, it's not a historic piece, it's not a science fiction, you know. But of course, any, every film has a genre, and if you dig very deep, and my film is an ensemble film, so you say, that's a genre. I thought about this genre rule, and I found it a bad rule because it's very difficult to avoid being a genre. Yeah. And it's not very creative because it's, it's, it's not easy to, it's not very specific. The good rules, the ones who are encouraging creatively were the specific rules. You're, you have to hold the camera in your hand. Mm -hmm. or you cannot add any props. But not being able to make a genre film or not being allowed to have taste is in a way impossible. Because every time you point a camera somewhere, you make an aesthetic choice. Things you put in your frame, and I think you leave out of your frame. To this hard house. <laughs> My master calls me. Lars has talked about it, Thomas has talked about it, Søren has talked about it, and I experienced it. How joyful it was to do film well, according to these rules. The King is Alive completes a quartet of films by the founding brotherhood. So maybe the most vital part of the dogma experiment is now complete. Do you think we'll make another dogma film when you're finished with this? Uh, no, I don't think so. We invented this in, in 95. We're done, Dogma. But that's not the end of the story. Next stop, America. The new VX220 has been described as the sexiest car that Vauxhall have ever built. Rubbish. It's scientifically impossible to have a natural feelings towards a car. Even if it has got a perfectly formed body or a racy exposed aluminium chassis. He took Dogma as being a chance to get the film done. A lot of first time filmmakers today are thrown into the situation where, you know, if they, they got $5 million to make a picture, but if it doesn't work out, they got to go work at McDonald's. It really puts them in a very stressful, uncreative situation. We shot uh, Lovers for a budget of about 400000 $500,000, and in all, it took us about seven months. Wow. And uh, all that time, not one studio nor television uh, company told us what to write, how to shoot, and that for us was a real change in contrast to other bigger projects. Do you really have to go to work? It's pas vrai. I can't believe it, you're such a baby. I cannot miss two days consecutive, I'll be fired. Check, wait, wait. I can't help it, Jay. You get me too excited. It's too much for me. The way you're dressed, I think it's the orange tights. What do you expect? We fall in love, she wants to go to work. Come on. Come on, 
Let's go back upstairs. What we wanted to make was a film that would touch and have an emotional intimacy that uh, the technology that preceded that didn't have. We wanted to be able to tell a story where all of a sudden anyone who's fallen in love would be able to identify with what's going on, and that for us is a cinematic experience. I mean, a really good set of rules is like a grid where people sort of pass through, but in order to pass through, they have to leave their own baggage behind because it won't get through the grid. And what's disappointing about a film like Love is it proves that someone can come to this kind of cinema, uh, to these practices, with, you know, the most banal preconceptions, the most kind of outmoded kind of, you know, post-post Nouvelle Vague, you know, romance. Um, and, and it still gets through. When we finished the film, uh, the hardest thing to deal with was trying to get through the Dogma Police and, right. and, and, and see if the film could pass. Well, and can they you describe had, that process for us? Well, we had to write a letter of confession. I'm proud to say that I was the one who invented the confessions. Actually, I did that to emphasize how rigid I was. Everyone, the four filmmakers who made the four previous Dogma films, watched the film and made their criticisms, and they allowed us three or four sins. It's a very, very difficult discussion every time, whether people have broken a rule or not, whether they have followed the, the intentions of Dogma 95 or not. For example, uh, it was not an apartment that existed as you see it. It was something that we created, so it wasn't really Dogma, but because we didn't know how much light this camera can go by and it's a camera that is very sensitive to light and you can shoot in very low light. Uh, we put a lot of lamps around. Do you credit yourself as director in this? No, no, just uh, holding the camera. The peculiar thing is that all the directors who've been associated with Dogma, we know who they are. Their name might not appear in the film, but we know who they are. They've each brought personal taste to bear. They all have turned up at festivals. And um, I thought, well, you know, if you're going to be, if you're going to make this claim to anonymity, well, you know, do it all the way. Pascal and I thought uh, to be a little different and also that the, that concept was a bit bourgeois of not putting the director's name on there as a director, uh, but Lars wouldn't let us get away with it. That's where I'm very dogmatic as they say. I think it's, it's not interesting if you don't take it serious, because when, then why do a dogma film? Yeah. It is, it is a little game, right? Sure. And if you don't follow the rules, then why, you know, why, why play football if you don't want to kind of put the ball in the, you know, the goal or whatever? In the beginning, Lars von Trier invited many A-list Hollywood directors to make a dogma film. Yeah, I never heard from anybody. So, does this mean dogma's too radical for the Yanks? I asked Mr. Spielberg himself, whether he wanted to do one or not. And he was very enth enthusiastic about it. I don't think he's going to do one. If he does, we will never know because he's not supposed to be credited, right? Exactly. exactly. So maybe it has been done already. But is it really possible for the dogma wave to cross the Atlantic? After all, what does Danish culture mean to the average American, except for a rather delicious kind of pastry? Next stop, New York. In the end, it was the most conspicuous figure in alternative US filmmaking, 25-year-old Harmony Corrine co-writer of Kids and director of Gummo, who rose to the challenge with Julian, Donkey Boy. A lot of people think that uh, it's a kind of joke, or you know, or there's like, or there's some kind of levity involved, but I wouldn't be interested in it if there was any irony attached to the valve chastity. It's, very, it's a very serious thing. <laughs> Sometimes I wish I was deaf. Why? I don't know, I think the world is just too loud. And... I kind of had lost faith, and I still have very little faith in a in a kind of um, in a, a formal screenplay structure. Um, it, it's just really boring to me. So what I did was I basically wrote a list of scenes of images, kind of like looking at photographs. It was much more random. Julian Donkey Boy is an abstract portrait of a schizophrenic young man and his dysfunctional family. She's never gonna learn to play this harp. Pearl. She's a dilettante Pearl. and she's a slut. Pearl, you're a dilettante and a slut. You're never gonna learn to play your heart. You need <laughs> I just can't stand this any longer. Come on, I can't stand this any longer. I might accidentally step no. away on this here. No. Come on, don't try to defend your sister. You just look stupid. I'm back. You're just I'm... stupid! You look so stupid, you look utterly and completely 
and irrevocably stupid. I'm not even You're stupid. so stupid, you I'm look so stupid. If I were so stupid, I would slap my own face. Ah <laughs> Well, I'm not even Maybe. stupid. Well, I'm not even stupid like that. Well, well I'm not even stupid like that. Tell him to slap his face. I'm not even stupid like that. Just slap his face. No, no Julie, no. relax. Don't no. pay attention to him. No, no, no. I ain't gotta be Don't stupid like that. Slap your face. I ain't gotta be stupid like that. I ain't gotta be stupid like that. No, I'm stupid like that. Tell him to slap his face. I was less interested in making it a kind of movie than almost like an artifact or some like just documenting some kind of action. We spoke to actor Ewan Bremner about his experience of a dogma movie. It's, it's, it's also a Harmony Kareem movie, you know, and Harmony Kareem doesn't make films like anybody else. You know, so just by dint of fact that I'm working on a Harmony Kareem movie is going to have demands which are beyond you know, what I'm used to. The fact that it was a dogma film was like sort of icing on the cake for me. To a certain extent what Lars was doing in The Idiots which for me is the most, one of the very, very interesting things of Idiots, this sudden experience of not quite knowing what you're witness to, whether you're in a real or unreal or fictional or you don't quite know any longer. I think Harmony was looking for that, those moments. James, yeah, yeah. I'm Gee, a black yeah. albino yeah. straight from yeah. Alabama, yeah. way down south, then you know that I'm a black albino straight from Alabama, way down south, then you know that I'm a black albino straight from Alabama, yeah, check it out. Check it out. On an artistic level, people are are taking the film, people, everybody's taking the film very seriously, um, which is good. A lot of people hate the film. Quite a lot of people, Americans, seem to be taking it quite technically. Okay, this is a dogma film, right. Okay, yes, I know all about dogma, yes. Oh, that, that flouts the dogma, doesn't it? Generally, there's nothing in the film that really flouts the dogma, I don't think. Anything that there is harmony is admitted, you know, is confessed as sins. There's a lot of ways that he got around the dogma in very ingenious ways. All the more interesting directors would, of course, go in their own direction. That is why, you know, they are interesting, but that also means that they would take a set of rules and kind of go to the limit or over. I mean, the good thing about them was they were written obtusely enough that that they left room to basically do anything that you that you would want to do in a film. You know, they weren't they weren't so restricting that I that I couldn't do what I wanted to do. It was just I had to go about go about it in another way. A lot of people misinterpreted that for some kind of for sinning again or breaking the rules. And which be, was a really boring argument for me because ultimately you want people to watch the film for the film. No, but if you actually stick a label right on the front of the film and say this is certificated and this is made according to the rules and you know here's the dog's ass and as soon as someone actually does accept a label, and it's not just any label, you know, it's now world famous, it, you know, it's a brand name, I mean it's, it's Nike, then you're asking for it to be talked about in very, very specific terms. <laughs> There's, of course, one thing which is definitely not a dogma thing, which is that she was not pregnant. Yeah, I believe he said he tried very hard to impregnate Clarice mm. Vigny, but... I wouldn't call it a sin because I tried, so... <laughs> it was just me shooting blanks. <laughs> <laughs> to me, that was, that was a very beautiful explanation. And what I found interesting with Harmony's film is that, to me, it's a very aesthetic film. It's very obsessed with its own aesthetics. You have a digital camera in your hand and, and there's a lot of things you can do and you can kind of make stop motion. And we kind of agreed on that because it happens in the very moment and it's a part of the set, so it follows the rules. But to me, it suddenly becomes untrue to this, the basic idea of dogma. Surely what's significant is that Kareen and the Dogma Brotherhood recognized kindred spirits in each other and symbolically joined hands across the Atlantic. But cynical critics insisted that Kareen was using Dogma as a marketing ploy, a way of flogging his otherwise unmarketable product by linking it to the latest craze. It didn't really help the box office sales, so it's not <laughs> like, uh, I mean, that accusation has no bearing. And uh, I mean, in America, the idea of, you know, of doing it, making a Dogma money, I mean, Dogma movie for the money, it's like, if anything, it would hinder. I don't even think that making a dogma film is necessarily cheaper than doing it regular. It probably would have cost me less money to do it a different way. Currently, there are dogma films planned in Denmark, Spain, Brazil, Italy, England, Korea, and just about everywhere else. So, has the movement been hijacked by producers keen to make a fast buck? It is not meant to be another package, another low-budget package. It, it's meant to... Um, awake some directors and to encourage some directors and to challenge some directors 
and filmmakers. Mm. It was not the idea to, cr to make a cheap film, but it's a dark film and it'll sell. I mean, yeah. that's nothing. It's now a tag or a license that other people can pick up. I mean, I keep finding reviews of little films from around the world and variety where it's either a dogma film, you know, it's the first Albanian dogma film or whatever, or someone has done a film dogma style. And it's, it's a term that's used so loosely. The danger is that it, it means nothing. There's many sad things to say about dogma right now. I mean, it's, for me, it's sad to hear that when they shoot Danish commercials, they want it dogma-like. I mean, that's not the point. It's, it's the point that people get angry and do something else, or they do this. Uh, it's, the point is to reflect the movie business as, as it is, not to give it another color. It's, it, the idea was to put a mirror in front of it and say, listen, we can do it another way as well. So I was ready to end it, but Lars uh, has a very generous mind and he said, well, other people could get a nice experience with this. And I kind of understood that. And for me, then it suddenly opened up this whole dogma concept. So, how have the four brothers kept the game fresh, short of changing the rules of play? There's been a lot talking about rules being modified. Mm -hmm. You cannot change the Ten Commandments. Correct. Right. But I, my, we, we've changed one, one thing that has changed. It has been, it's been that dogma has gone from Catholicism to Protestantism. To get the dogma certificate now, a director just signs a piece of paper saying that he or she has obeyed the rules, and um, that's it. We didn't expect anything when we sat down there in 1995. We wanted to do four films in another way. We wanted to have a brotherhood. We, it was a kind of protest against several things. But now when it suddenly became a wave, I don't know why it became a wave. Uh, why, be, why should we sit there and be being judges? Estonia or some of these yeah. countries, they also suddenly can make films, you know, because if that's a film, you know, then we can make films too. I think that's great. Mm. Fantastic. Yeah, instead of thinking, oh, if it doesn't look like Star Wars, then we can't make a film, and then, you know. If that is the only thing that comes out of these rules, I think it's fantastic. It doesn't worry you that the, 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 the quality control will fall off and the dogma name will be tarnished. It's not a Walt Disney label, you know. It's, it's, it's a political movement, so it's free for everybody to use or misuse, yeah. Uh -huh. If it's a political movement, what's the objective? It's just to, to kick some ass in a, in a, in a sloppy uh, business, you know. Yes, I am! <laughs> you know, there's nothing new to this fucking dogma movie. Nothing at all if you look into uh, film history, more or less. But it's nice, even now and then, every you know, business need a movement that's doing something new, or at least try to call it something new. Yeah. <laughs> or, uh, so that's good, and uh, now we look for someone to rebel against us. And it's possible that you'll inspire completely different manifestos. I'll inspire people to throw this manifesto away, yeah, what, why not? Why shouldn't they have the fun? Give the exercise, you know. <laughs> <laughs> good for your muscles, too. <laughs> Madness. <laughs> First film in Thor's Dogma 95 season is Feston on Tuesday at 11.35. We're coming up, relive the last week in the Big Brother house and catch lots of juicy unseen footage next on Thor.